Hello again. This is Barry Chase, the senior partner at Chase Lawyers. And today we're going to be talking about the mysterious doctrine known as fair use. So stay tuned. So what do we mean by fair use? And what do we mean by copyright, which is what the fair use doctrine is all about? Well, those of you who've been watching some of our other videos uh, might already know this, but copyright is property. The copyright in a book, the copyright in a film, the copyright in a painting, all of those things are intellectual property, which it can be owned, can be transferred, can be licensed, and money can be made on it. And in fact, copyright was embodied in the Constitution of the United States in Article 2, Section 8, where the Congress has the power to reserve to authors the fruits of their own work for periods of time, for limited periods of time. Authors at this point can mean anything because at the time it was just written material, but now it's movies and it's TV shows and it's, uh, well, it's books as it always was. It could be maps. It could be uh, even uh, plans for a building, which are owned and the copyright in them is owned by the architect. So what do we mean when we talk about fair use of copyrighted material? Well, it seems a strange thing to start off with. If copyright is property, the way your car is, well, how come someone can just use your car without your permission and call it fair? Oh, I'm just going to take your car out for a, a, a brief tour and a, go to the supermarket, but it's only going to be a couple of hours this afternoon, and I don't really need your permission to do that. I'm just going to go do it. Well, that's unheard of. You wouldn't tolerate that, and you wouldn't expect that. But in the area of copyright, because there's a tension between ownership of the original copyright and the need to build on the creative work of others who have come before us. For example, we talk a lot about building on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And obviously anything, musical works, uh, novels, what have you, the people who create those things today are building on uh, traditions and building on work, creative work that was done before. And so what is fair use and how do we limit that so that it doesn't end up in ridiculous situations like the unpermitted borrowing of your car. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about. Now, copyright is a little bit fuzzy to understand. And in fact, in the early days of music copyright, for example, there were a lot of venues that were performing the music of composers and didn't feel that it should be anything but free as the air. Why, why is it property? I have music and I'm someone singing it here in my venue. And why do I have to pay anybody? Well, the fact is that the work of creating something like a musical composition can be very hard work. Do we have geniuses in history? Uh, Mozart, for example, was reputed never to really have, been, have, have had to edit his work. He just wrote something down and bang, you had a symphony. Um, though that wasn't quite true. There were some editing marks in his original uh, sheet music. Um, but in general, if you're not a genius like Mozart, it's hard work to get, for example, a musical composition recorded uh, and distributed. So it seems a little unfair that someone else could use any of that without your need to, to get a permission, get license from the original owner of the copyright and yet that has grown up in the law. Now, how did this happen? Uh, we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of this um, and the myths that have grown up around it so that we can understand what is and isn't fair use based on a statute. It's actually in the Copyright uh, uh, Act. And uh, also that's been built up uh, by judges. So stay tuned and we're gonna get into some of the specifics in a few minutes. Okay, so if we know that copyright is a property right, and yet fair use permits you to use some of someone else's property without permission, um, 
what are the standards for that? And what are the do's and don'ts? Well, I can give you five very common myths that have grown up around fair use. The first, and it's sort of appealing, is that, well, if I only use a little bit, you know, musicians sometimes worry about how many notes or how many bars they can use. Uh, people who uh, uh, do some writing worry about, well, I guess I can just take uh, a couple of paragraphs of something, uh, or I can just take a scene from a movie. It's only one scene after all, it's 30 seconds compared to the almost two hour length of the movie. Uh, what harm could that cause? Well, it's not that simple. In fact, if you take a portion that is at the heart and soul of what the original creator has created, you may be infringing copyright. It doesn't matter how long your excerpt is. For example, just to take one famous case, George Harrison, one of the uh, Beatles, um, uh, wrote a song after the Beatles broke up called My Sweet Lord. And the, the, key, the key music to that came to, you know, my sweet Lord, da, 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 da. Okay, that's four notes. You would think that you could use those four notes even if it had existed prior to that. But in fact, after a litigation, Harrison had to settle for a large amount because there was a song way back in the 60s, the 50s or 60s um, that was called He's So Fine. And the notes to that went, he's so fine. He's so fine, gotta be mine, blah, 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 blah. Well, those four notes were at the heart of both of those works. And in that case, just because they were only four notes did not absolve George Harrison of liability. No one thinks that given his situation after the Beatles uh, made jillions of dollars that he needed to steal anybody's work, but they were floating around in his head and they ended up being the same four notes that were key to his song, My Sweet Lord, which came out uh, uh, maybe 20 or 30 years after the He's So Fine. I think it was the Shirelles, but don't hold me to that. In any event, that's myth number one. So it, can't, it isn't always the case that just a short excerpt and the, uh, the borrowing, if you will, or the stealing, depending on how it comes out in court, of that short excerpt uh, is gonna protect you. Now, the, the, the second myth, is that it's okay to use uh, uh, their property, someone else's property, if you just give it a credit. So for example, you take someone's photograph of uh, let's say Prince, and here we have a recent case involving Andy Warhol's derivative work, which means that it's a, it's a theft, as opposed to fair use, which means it wouldn't be a theft, of a photograph that was taken uh, by a photographer some years earlier, uh, and that was later used for, uh, or that later used by Warhol uh, and used as cover art for magazines and things like that. Um, in fact, what happened in that case was it, that it was found, this is a recent case in New York, uh, that it was found that Warhol did not have the right to use uh, a, a, that photograph and simply to turn it into his own idiosyncratic form of, of popular art um, without getting a license from the photographer. So um, uh, it, just because you give a credit to someone doesn't mean that you haven't taken something that doesn't belong to you. And so the idea that, oh, I'll just credit so-and-so and therefore it'll clean up any possibility of copyright infringement, also a myth. That's myth number two. Now, myth number three um, is that uh, if you say on your use, well, I'm not claiming any copyright in this. I, uh, I'm just saying that I'm just using it, but you know, I'm not claiming any copyright, no copyright claim intended, et cetera. That's not an infringement. Well, you know, I always say that's a little like the bank robber walking into the bank. And as he holds up his pistol to point it at the teller, the pistol unfurls a little banner that says, this is not a bank robbery, but it is a bank robbery. So that myth doesn't work either. It doesn't really help to do that. If anything, it may even put you in a worse position because you recognize that you're taking copyrighted property. So that's myth number three, and it is a myth. Um, now, uh, the, akin to that, but it's a separate myth, is that if you simply say, 
well, I'm using this uh, in the nature of fair use of so-and-so's copyrighted something or other. Well, that's the same thing. You can say it's a fair use, but it may not be. It may be something like the George Harrison uh, example that we just talked about. Could be anything else. But uh, if you, for example, take a little bit and you think you're safe because that's just a fair use, but it turns out to be the heart of what someone else has created prior to you and owns because copyright is owned as soon as it's written down, for example, then that's not gonna work either. You can't just do that. And then finally, um, uh, one other seemingly clever thing that some borrowers of copyrighted material have tried to do is to invite the copyright owner to comment on what he's done or to object if they are not happy uh, with the amount or the kind of thing that's been quote borrowed, if it's decided to be fair use or infringed on, uh, stolen. Um, that's not gonna work either. Uh, the, the, the copyright owner is not responsible for coming to the secondary user and saying, uh, oh yeah, now that I see that you're using it and everything, let's talk about whether there should be a license here. Uh, again, a myth. So none of those things will remove the stain of copyright infringement that may apply. Now there are ways though that fair use still survives. I'd wanna tell you a little story or two about that. I have a, a wife, um, a dear wife of 40 years who designs crazy things like uh, crazy sunglasses. And at one point she came to me and she had done sunglasses, uh, sunglass frames. They're really things that she puts on the frames. And sometimes they're birthday glasses. She has a series of divorce glasses where the other spouse's head is cut off uh, from what would be a, 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 a two of them on a cake. Um, she's done silly things like that. And one of the things she did was wanted to make a music pair of sunglasses and she was gonna use little plastic representations of the members of the Beatles. Now, did she violate their right not to have their faces, which they have ownership of under a different doctrine called uh, rights of personality? Did she have the right just to do that? And believe me, it was not a simple answer that I had to give her because yes, she had taken something that doesn't belong to her and is gonna use it to sell, but she's an artist. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is whether artistic conversion and the extent to which artistic conversion can end up giving you fair use protection, even though you're stealing someone else's intellectual property rights. Stay tuned for that. We're gonna to get to it in just a moment. Okay, now the doctrine of fair use though, is an exception to the ownership of copyright. Remember, we're talking about a situation where somebody takes, let's say sampling in music, which for some reason has come to be recognized as something which is okay to do. Uh, it's taking some notes from a prior recording of something, using it in a new work and acting as if no one owns those prior notes in the recording. Uh, almost universally, whenever tested, those sampling examples have been held to be infringements. So it's not a good idea to do that without consulting a lawyer that you trust. And let me tell you that even lawyers find this doctrine frustrating because as you'll see in a moment, the standards that have been developed by judges over the 19th and 20th century and then put into the Copyright Act, Section 107, are themselves, there's four factors and by themselves, they are also rather iffy, rather squishy, rather vague. So it's difficult for courts to apply them. And even the extent to which they are to be evaluated against one another is still unsettled in court, which makes it very difficult for a lawyer to advise you on whether what you want to do is going to be fair use. So before you do that, depending on the fair use idea, you really ought to consult a lawyer and at least find out how close you are to getting in trouble. Now, let me talk about the four, the four factors. Those four factors, as I say, have been embodied in section 107 of the Copyright Act. And this came though from judges who over a couple of centuries had developed these exceptions. 
One of the factors is, and I'm going to have to read a little language here from the law, but one of the factors is the purpose and character of the use, including whether it's of a commercial nature or it's for nonprofit educational purposes. So if you're using something in a classroom, for example, you seem to come right into the heart of this exception, and maybe you'll be okay. That, that argues in favor of your ability to make fair use of someone else's property. The second is the super vague, the nature of the copyrighted work. That means the nature of the work you're borrowing from. Um, no one really knows what that means, uh, but it's, it's attempted to be analyzed in each case, all of which are very fact intensive, very, very specifically fact intensive, depending on what the copyrighted work was like and what you're borrowing, which you hope to, you hope the judge will agree that it's borrowing, not theft, uh, what that was like. Third factor, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. Now that's obviously important. It, that has to do with how much you use and has been used by people who have, have tried to use one of those myths about, well, I only used four notes. Uh, again, remember, it's not just the extent of the borrowing, it's the substantiality, which is what would have hung up George Harrison in the example we used. Da, 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 da. It's only four notes, but it's four notes that are immediately recognizable by someone who knew about the prior work. And it's the notes that are in everybody's head about the prior work. So they're substantial in the prior work. And then finally, and this is the one I want you to keep in your mind. I don't want you to uh, necessarily uh, try to learn by heart all these things, but the one that you ought to really think about is the effect of the use, that is the, the attempted fair use, uh, upon the potential market for the that for or value of the copyrighted work. In other words, if what you're doing invades the ability of the original, the original owner of the copyright to make money on the copyrighted work, then that's gonna be a problem for you uh, because you've displaced one of the core purposes of copyright. The copyright law, after all, the whole thing is to give a property right to creative people so they'll continue creating. So that this won't be the last musical composition I ever do. So that this won't be the last book I ever do because I can make the money off it and I'm the only one who can make the money off it because I own the copyright. So it's an exception to that idea. And let's talk about these factors. Um, remembering again, no one of them can be analyzed separately from the other three, which really gives you four independent variables and is one reason why it's so frustratingly difficult to predict the way things will come out, except in very clear cases. Now, uh, let's talk about the purpose and character of the use. Um, uh, if you're using it for nonprofit purposes, you're more safe than if you're trying to make money yourself on it. Uh, that doesn't mean that every use by a nonprofit will work. For example, if the American Cancer Society used a photo that was of value to the photographer um, and has, for which there has become a market, I don't think they could put that on the cover of their brochure without getting a license from the photographer, even though they're a nonprofit. So again, you can stretch that factor or you can stay in the heart of it. I think if you're teaching something in a classroom or if you're doing literary criticism or what have you like that, um, you're safer than if it were some other kind of use. Uh, okay, number two is the nature of the copyrighted work. Now here, that's a very vague standard. Certain things have grown up. If, for example, uh, someone has taken some pages from a geography book that you may have authored, that you may have gathered, it's just fact. Geography is geography. It's not an expression of anything terribly new and creative. So in that case, it's easier for you to borrow some of it and be protected in your borrowing. It's gonna be easier to make the case for fair use of something that is less creative in that sense. And while we don't like judges deciding, well, what's more creative and what's less creative? Is Mozart more creative than Beethoven or less? Uh, we don't want judges deciding that. Um, we don't want anybody deciding that sort of thing really, but certainly not judges because it has consequences for everybody. So in that case though, 
as opposed to like a Harry Potter novel, which is all very creative, it's gonna be more likely that you'll be absolved of responsibility for stealing if you take something from a geography notebook or from a, uh, another sort of catalog type uh, work that is protected by copyright, but just isn't as creative, quote unquote. All right, so that's number two. Number three, the amount and substantiality of the portion used by the claimer, by the, the um, arguer, for fair use. Now here, um, we talked a little bit about uh, the, uh, the, the fact that uh, substantiality may mean the heart and soul of the work. In some cases, the, the, the amount and the substantiality uh, may actually be almost the whole work. For example, there was a famous case involving two live crew where they took the entire melody of, of Oh, Pretty Woman. You may remember this song by Roy Orbison. Pretty woman, da, 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 da. Film was made around that, that song starring, uh, uh, I forget her name, um, but uh, it, 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 um, Richard Gere was in the male role uh, and Julia Roberts, I'm sorry, was in, the, was in the female lead. And it's a fun film, um, uh, but the, leaving aside the film question, the, the parody, the work that Two Live Crew did was to uh, use all of Orbison's melody. Um, and how did, how did they get away with that? Which they did after a big fight in court. Here's what happened with that one. It was parody and true parody said the Supreme Court, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, involves making fun of the original or commenting on the original work as well as just using maybe all of it. Um, and in that case, the court found that Two Live Crew's version of the music was commenting on the naivete, et cetera, of the Orbison original, and therefore was truly a parody. In other words, if all you do is use someone else's melody, but it doesn't comment on that melody or on the lyrics of the, of the original, you haven't created something that's fair use. You haven't created a true parody. So don't just assume you can use that thing, change the words and you're okay. Um, you have to comment not just on, on life and politics, you have to comment on the original from which you are borrowing all this amount. Okay, uh, finally, and this is the one that is the one that is most in common to the decisions by judges. And so the one that you have to focus on more than any other. Have you displaced the market? for the original work. And this is sometimes a tough one, but if, for example, and, and this doesn't mean that it's in every case. I mean, in the, in the case of the George Harrison, my sweet Lord, my da da da, it's unlikely that he would have displaced the market for he's so fine, which is a whole different kind of uh, musical composition. Um, but there it was because it was the heart and soul, it was the substantiality of, of, of what he took from the original. Here, you're talking about whether something can harm the marketability. And here, the, the most famous case is a news report of all things. You would think that news, in fact, that's an educational value. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a, an important value for us to get news. And a news report uh, was held to be not fair use. It usually is fair use if you just use some of, some of what it is. But here's what this news report did. There was an act, there was a cannonball uh, act where a guy was shot out of a cannonball into a net, you know, across, I don't know, 100 feet or maybe 100 yards of open space and, you know, survived it each time. And that was his act. It was a cannonball act. What the news report did was take the entire act and present it as a news item. And so they had given someone the possibility of recording from the news report, the entire cannonball act and ruining the market for the poor cannonball guy, the, can the cannonball fodder guy's uh, ability to make money on it. And the court there said, uh, uh not a fair use, even though it's in a news report, so this won't work. So those are the four factors. The one that I want to leave you with most focus on though, is that fourth one which is if you're doing something which displaces any portion of the ability to make money on the original, you're asking for trouble. So don't do that.
Okay, so that we now have covered these four factors, these mysterious four factors for evaluating whether something is a fair use and therefore is a permissible borrowing of someone else's intellectual property rights, uh, or whether it is theft, whether it's stealing, in which case you've infringed, in which case there may be all kinds of damages. So it's a scary situation. Now, uh, let me just tell you that relying on fair use is a risky business, no matter what you do. And it's always better to get a license from the original owner. You can sometimes negotiate these things and sometimes you use the possibility of a fair use defense to negotiate a better deal with the original owner because original owners have lawyers as well. Uh, and if it's something prominent enough that you wanna use it, this is probably someone who's made some money on the original work and therefore can afford to consult a lawyer and or, or may already know a lot about fair use just by being in the intellectual property field. So it's still risky and it's always better to get a license. Now, the, the, the facts are that the facts are key to deciding whether or not you'll be uh, a, a judge to have uh, made a fair use of someone else's work or whether you've stolen someone else's work. Um, only though where there are similar decisions that are almost as we lawyers say on point or on all fours, you know, one of the little phrases we use like a little doggy standing there on all fours, as opposed to limping around on just three legs. Um, if it's on all fours with a prior case, if the facts are really similar or close to similar, then a lawyer can give you some concrete advice. Well, you know, the courts have held this to be okay, uh, so go ahead and do it this way. Um, but we don't always find those cases. So um, uh, the, the other thing that is a problem is that the, the claim you make that you looked at the four factors and they seem okay, is that you've just added them up. And that's not the way judges will decide the case. Judges will look at each of the four factors. They will look at who sort of wins and loses on each of the four factors, but they will then do this sort of magical potion of mixing them all, again, with the most important being whether you've invaded the market of the original owner to make money on the original work. Um, and the judge will come up with a decision. Now, the, the only thing you can do and the only thing your lawyer can do to help put you on a, a more solid footing um, is to look at what the purpose of the Copyright Act is and was. It is to, to reserve to authors, to the creative community, the right to make money on what they do. So you have to go back and you have to ask yourself whether your use is gonna invade that right whether it's gonna invade the spirit of what someone else has already created, whether it's gonna invade the heart and soul of it, et cetera, and then try to make an evaluation or your lawyer will uh, of whether or not this is likely to be found to be fair use. So it is a complicated factor. I know I, I, we represent a lot of people at Chase Lawyers and you can certainly call us on this. You can get a hold of me. On, you'll see on the screen my email address and my phone number. Um, and I do advise you to consult a lawyer if you're putting any kind of major resources into something you think will be okay because it's fair use. You really ought to have it analyzed. It is not something that should be done by anything but professionals. You need what's, what's called a trained professional to evaluate this and to advise you on it. And I wish you a lot of luck. And I also suggest to you that, you know, if your, your business, if your own creative work depends a lot on using someone else's material, then you should really try to get a license for that material and you'll clear all this up and you don't have to bother watching this, uh, this presentation. So uh, I appreciate that you did watch it and I look forward to talking to you about something else the next time. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button below Very nice. and let us know. Yeah, and you're gonna... Also, you can subscribe to the Chase Lawyers YouTube channel for more legal tips for those in the entertainment industry like yourself. And if you have other topics you want us to cover, please let us know in your comments below so that we can help you out in that way too. See you soon.